2021. I am Lorraine Mockford, LV across the metaverse. I am the VWBPE 2021 program chair. It is my honor to introduce the first keynote speaker of the conference, Professor Dr. Ondine Fruming. Dr. Fleming will be speaking today about the history of virtual reality and the meaning of VR for education. Dr. Undin Fleming is a professor at HMKR Berlin, University of Applied Science for Media, Communication and Management in Berlin, Germany. She is the head of the master's program in visual and media anthropology at HK, HMKW Berlin. She received her PhD in 2005 from the Institute for uh, Social and Cultural Anthropology. And I've added too much to that note. Hang on. Uh, <clears throat> and was a junior professor and professor at Freie Unistat in Berlin from 2009 to 2019. In addition to her interest in visual and media anthropology, she specializes in environmental anthropology. Dr. Fleming has completed several visual anthropological field work studies in Eastern Indonesia in East Africa, Tanzania, and in Iceland, and in different online communities and virtual worlds. She's published many articles and books about digital environments, virtual worlds, and, and on disasters. She was one of the principal investigators of the third party funded BMBF research project, ANIC, A-N-I-K, Visualization and Mapping of Alpine Risks in the Time of Climate Change, and one of the principal investigators of the European Union research projects, uh, especially number one was Writer, Writing, Reading, Inclusion, and European Richness. Dr. Fleming has worked for TV broadcasting studios in Berlin and has her own company that produces viral videos for environmental education. Her most important publications include, and I've listed them here. Please hold your questions for the end. Either send your questions to me directly via IM or indicate in local chat with a queue. Over to you, Dr. Fleming. Please give her a big VWBPE welcome. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to this keynote for the Virtual World's Best Practice in Education Conference. I want to address the history of Virtual Worlds and will speak about the advantages and challenges of learning and teaching in virtual reality. I will furthermore have a look at the current and historical practices of modeling culture and landscape in virtual reality. I will raise the question, why do humans create models of cultural assets and historical situations and landscapes? To answer this question, we need to go back in history and raise the question why we became digital.
When I entered the virtual world of Second Life in the year 2007, the first time, I immediately was convinced that this world could be enormous useful in case of a catastrophe. I teach digital anthropology classes and ethnographic methods in Second Life now since 14 years for universities in Germany. In those time, I thought more about um, a natural or nuclear catastrophe that does not allow people to leave the home anymore. We ended up in the year 2020 and 2021 in a situation that does not allow us to be close to other human beings. Something that is so difficult to avoid when teacher and students are meeting for classes. Having invented those virtual worlds with virtual classrooms and avatars is such a relief at the moment, and I think you all agree that virtual worlds could even be used more effectively for teaching and learning of all ages, from school to university to lifelong learning. I am thankful to Linden Lab and the programmers and lecturer who put so many efforts into building amazing virtual worlds and avatar bodies that enable us to meet virtually. And it is such a great experience that we come together today from so many different countries for the Virtual World's Best Practice and Education Conference to exchange about our experiences and knowledge of teaching in virtual real realities. Welcome, everyone. Thanks to Lorraine and Heike and all of the others for the very professional organization of the conference. Most of us are here because we were searching for an alternative way of teaching, a more playful, maybe more colorful, more interesting way of teaching experiences for students and also for ourselves. But we are also here to face the challenges of education in virtual worlds and talk about new promising inventions in VR and AR technology that will have a large impact on the way we will teach and learn online in the future. Oliver Grau stresses in his article from 1999 that virtual reality is not an entirely new phenomenon. Instead, he demonstrates that the idea of transporting the audience into enclosed illusionary visual spaces is grounded in a tradition within art history. Its core idea, which reaches back to antiquity, has been reviewed and expanded in the virtual reality art and, as I would like to add, as well in VR life simulation of the current century. This kind of virtual reality excludes the sensation of being alienated by the image and surrounds the observer in an illusionary setting where time and space are one. Jot Steuer argued in the same direction that virtual reality should not be solely viewed at the technological level, but should be historically contextualized in order to comprehend its explosive impact as well as its close connection to political power. We can find the very early practice of creating a virtual reality in cage paintings in Indonesia 40,000 years ago. Here in the image you can see a human hand and a pic, uh, a pic here yeah, from a hunting scene. Yeah, wait. Here's the pic. <laughs> 
cage paintings are very important in human civilization because they prove the ability of an abstract or symbolic thinking, what is considered to be crucial for human civilization and culture. Another example for the early creation of virtual reality is the Villa Item, the so-called Casa del Mystery at Pompeii, which dates from 60 BC. It shows wall paintings that extended the room through representations of views into other spaces. Another example is the Sala delle Prospettive, created between 1516 and 1518 in the Villa Farnesina in Rome. It is the fresco of a virtual column hall, painted in the perspective that offered illusionistic views of Rome and its surrounding countryside. One other example for the imagination about the early creation of artificial bodies is the creation of the homunculus, as described, for example, in Goethe's Faust in, eight, in the 18th century. I really love this image, by the way, what we see here. The longing for virtual reality and the 3D modeling of human beings and culture or simulation of life is a very old and probably an anthropological constant and we can find its very early traps as well in mythology. Even though most myths were only transported orally, we find a very rich world of images inside mythology, what Kit Steiner would call the images inside our heads. Also, Ovid's staged myth of Pygmalion of Cyprus uh, in the Metamorphosen, Book 10, is one early example of the virtual recreation of the body. Pygmalion was a sculpture and statue lover who falls in love with a woman statue he created himself and which finally comes alive with the help of goddess Venus. This myth, interpreted by Ovid, serves as a well uh, to illuminate the, the root of the debate about the iconic turn. One is familiar with this debate only too well within picture theory, and also Mitchell, Kitsteiner, Kruse and others have referred to this skepticism bothering art history. The humanities, overcoming the fear of writing about the fixed myth, needed an entire century to surmount their own iconophobia. So, the fear to face images. Now, virtual words are more than plain pictures. Virtual words only embody what all other media, except for plain information media, have in common. They are transmitters. They are a symbolic world. They are an expression of culture and what she suppresses. Virtual worlds are an expression of society and of distant places which people once have been to or at least have seen or heard of in the past. The difference is that sound and vision in this world expires text, probably also because sound and vision are universally far better understood and easier to handle with than text. The unknown and new aspect of these virtual worlds is, in every respect, a new way of looking and experiencing architecture and landscape. Most virtual worlds offer an ego perspective and a third-person perspective. The user constantly moves around with the view through an object lens of the camera. The eyes are detached from the body like an observation camera, and the human sense of sight as well as the forms of locomotion, for example flying and teleporting, have been enhanced enormously. 
Nevertheless, the digital body stays captured in imagination, even in a virtual world. During industrial revolution, another invention, the new image machine, the so-called panorama, achieved new dimensions of illusionary effects. This panorama was used for military strategies, but as well to show virtual images of foreign countries and cultures and beautiful landscapes, such as the Panorama Nesdek in the Netherlands, which was giving the spectator the feeling to be present with the own body in a beach scenery. This was in the year 1881. Interesting is that the panorama was criticized mainly for psychological reasons, similar to the critique of virtual reality nowadays. It was argued that the illusion could result in an inability to perceive reality. So, short to say, people cannot cope with this illusion. Nevertheless, the mass media panorama spread successfully with at least 100 million people visiting the 300 to about 400 panoramic rotundas in Europe and America between the years um, 1870 and 1900 alone. The Kaiser panorama that we see here in the image can still today be visited at Märkisches Museum Berlin in Germany. It shows the German Empire at times of Kaiser Wilhelm I. Interestingly, a lot of women <laughs> were interested in this, as we see here in the image. As often in history, writer or artists are the first who describe new technological inventions with their fantasy. This was the case with Stanley G. Weinbaum. In 1935, the American science fiction writer Weinbaum wrote the story Pygmalion Spectacles. The main character meets a professor who invented a pair of glasses that were able to show a movie not only with images, but also with sound, taste, smell and touch. With the help of the glasses, the viewer was teleported into the story and able to speak to shadows, and they even replied. The viewer became the main character of the story in wearing this kind of glasses. So interestingly, what Weinbaum described in his fiction novel is very close to the invention of HMD headsets or even AR glasses today. As a short side note, of course, it is important to differentiate between computer-generated virtual reality where the content is rendered by 3D model and where the usage without HMD is possible. Fundamental different is the combination of 360 degree video and CG based content that necessarily needs the usage of a head mounted display. In the year 1956, cinematographer Morten Heilig created the Sensorama, the first VR machine which was patented in 1962. The machine was able to stimulate all of the human senses. Morton Heilig called the machine the cinema of the future. The sensorama simulated 3D video in color, audio, several vibrations and even smell and atmospheric phenomena for example, wind. So I think we are still far away from this with our HMDs at the moment. The 
the first HMD device that was connected to a computer, not only to a camera, was invented by the computer scientist Evan Sutherland, professor at the University of Uter. Sutherland called the device the Sword of Damocles because the construction was a bit dangerous, hanging on the ceiling. So they were the whole time afraid that this whole apparat could fall down. Therefore, the name the Sword of Damocles. As you can see, the construction was also very heavy and the user experience um, for sure um, also a bit scary adventure. So we jump now to the 1990s. Um, of course, I I jump I make some big jumps here in in my speech because um, I cannot come to all of the even smaller inventions. But very important was in the 1990s the virtual reality technology that was used for training and simulation in the U.S. military and the NASA astronauts at the NASA can use the NASA VR lab for a virtual reality experience. They can enter the virtual world of the ESS and the space using a headset, haptic feedback gloves and motion trackers. AR technology with smart glass is nowadays also used in the military to train drone pilots and to operate during missions. So I want to come quickly to the commercial HMD headsets. Um, we come close to, to the 2021. Oculus Rift invented uh, 20, um, in, in 30, 2013. Um, interestingly, as maybe some of you know, this was a Kickstarter campaign that was so successful that they could um, make really in four days all of the money to to, in, to build the Oculus. Um, one year later only, um, Oculus VR sold um, the whole device to Facebook Inc. in March 2014 for 400 million US dollars and also some um, stock. But um, yeah, this was not so good for the rep reputation of Oculus VR because the people who invented in the um, paid for the Kickstarter campaign were not so happy about this. Um, yeah, we have the Samsung Gear, of course, uh, Samsung Gear VR in 2014. We have the HTC Vive in 2015 and uh, Apple VR and Mixed Reality headsets in 2021, if we can speak from this already. There are some challenges with HMD for VR. Most of it is motion sickness, it's the latency, and it's the overheating that makes big problems, and it's the high price and also the usability. Especially the big size of the HMDs, not only um, do they have a problematic aesthetic, but also they are um, very uncomfortable to wear as a user experience and this was mainly criticized and um, also the problem with the overheating so they are developing at the moment um, some ventilators to to cool these devices down so that people will not burn their their faces whilst wearing this so this is still this was a was a problem uh, one years ago and this is still a problem nowadays um, this disadvantages of HMDs, um, especially also the motion sickness and um, that people simply don't like wearing these heavy things on their noses and ears and um, eyes, was the reason um, that this HMDs finally never really kicked off and um, therefore the big players are moving forward towards the development of smaller augmented reality glasses at the moment.
there will be several new ARR glasses on the market soon. We know that Google Glass had huge image problems because of the camera function in the lens and data protection concerns. So people simply were afraid of, wow, someone is wearing this Google Glass and there's a camera in. And if this person sits next to me in a cafe or restaurant, is he or she filming me? What's going on there? So um, this was a big problem, uh, image problem, and therefore it never kicked off. Apple AR Glass is the name of the new augmented reality smart glass that is coming probably 2023, latest 2025. It will let user be able to digitally teleport to different parts of the world, similar to Google Street View, but the view is projected directly onto the glass lenses. So Apple is um, doing the following. They are upgrading the feature in the Apple Maps um, app now called Look Around, but this Look Around um, would then be much more immersive on, on the Apple Glass. So it's a projection of the Apple map look around on, on the glass. Furthermore, um, it seems to that, I mean, this is not official, this are all leaks, that Apple is adding depth sensors to the glasses in a way that they can help you see better the dark, in the dark. So these depth sensors will enable you to have a much better view when driving the car, for example, in darkness and they provide a greater look at the world around you. Apple glasses may also be able to track your finger and hand movements um, more accurately thanks to some Bluetooth um, operating small smart rings that Apple has already patented. This makes the whole motion tracking and also the feeling more accurate and um, there's no need for any external sensor with cables, etc. anymore. Something what we know from, from the Oculus Rift, for example. Um, okay, before I come to the next... Um, but this is still fiction, so this will come maybe 2023, 2025, we don't know yet. Maybe also earlier in, in a surprise. Yeah? The VR technology itself, um, the technology of digital cultures has initiated a big change, I want to say, which brings pictures to life. They can now be designed, they can be experienced, and they invite also to adventures and to roaming around. But over the last decade we have see, seen many virtual worlds dying and the takeoff of VR with HMDs did not take place yet. The question is through where is the stream of duplifying our world and humans? Where will it lead to in the commencing digital urban era? Is it the back door to escape the dangerous actual life in times of a pandemic or other catastrophes? Do VR worlds enable us to recreate or unfold beautiful new learning environments? Everything, everything looks like at the moment that education in the future will be a lot based on augmented reality and the new smart glasses. The, the challenge is to melt the VR worlds into smart and mobile AR technology worlds. As we all know, the SL mobile version is awaited since a long time and overdue. Maybe the second life world has also be, been grown too big to give a comfortable feeling to new residents who feel lost in the endless, mostly empty possibilities. The attraction of second life, the alternative lifestyle and the endless possibilities of creating and folding and renewing their own personality in 
second life stopped at the same time the further enhancement of the virtual world. At some points, new villages, societies, or worlds new, need also guidance and rules to be established as meaningful and to start becoming culture. Or as Edward Bernard Tyler said, culture is that complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, art, law, morals, custom, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. What we missed with Second Life is a kind of urban planning and cultural guidance to make the world a pleasant environment for all ages and gender to learn and to experience. Virtual worlds embody the human longing to be immortal, to overcome the body, to fly with one click from one region to another, to switch the body from old to young, from fat to thin, or from female to fe male, or even animal, to change the skin color. Virtual worlds enable us to enter the absent space and the absent body, and they are the consequential further development of telecommunication to teleporting, as one can find in Perry Rodin's novels or in the Star Trek universe. It is noticeable that already numerous avatars have been born in virtual environments and even given birth in being virtually pregnant to baby avatars. The dream of reduplicating the world, humans and their culture is a very old anthropological constant and can be found in mummification in wax figures or statues such as in the Pygmalion myths. For sure it will be useful to have the possibility of virtual models for cultural heritage, for scientific research, for museums and and for education. And what we discover already since a few years is a stronger cooperation between the gaming industry and the education sector. This collaboration can be interesting to represent and explain, for example, complex historical periods, other cultures and their different religious belief systems, or local knowledge with an interactive approach. Definitely the development of augmented reality technology such as smart AR glasses in combination with VR worlds will influence human societies in the future. They have all in common to replace the computer as a machine disconnected from the body with the aim to bring technique closer to the body or even embody techniques. At the same time, it is the goodbye to hundreds of years old, to the hundreds of years old idea to incorporate all technology in one HMD device. Instead, um, the new AR glasses will work in combination with a smartphone and Bluetooth. This development will bring uh, a new mobility and flexibility to, hu to humans and release human beings from a 40 years long lasting area of sitting in front of a home computer and also be freeing them from the presence of huge HMDs on their heads that did not allow, for example, multitasking um, means to open any other app at the same time. This was also something what the user complained a lot about when using HMDs and you ever experienced it, you can really feel like, okay, can I take it off now? Because I want to do something meanwhile. We are used to doing several things at the same time. The new AR glasses will have this possibility that you can open other apps meanwhile using the glasses just as a gadget, but a very important one. I will now shortly speak about my own experience um, of education in virtual reality. 
the following situation happened this semester in my virtual classroom. I asked my students how they feel sitting with their avatars in our Second Life classroom instead of meeting via the video conferencing software, which we use regularly nowadays during the pandemic. A student said she feels much more relaxed with the avatar because the video chats are so exhausting for her. Other students agreed that meeting with avatars is much more fun and not so exhausting. The virtual classroom also gives a sense of belonging and a feeling of security. It seemed that the typical Zoom fatigue, the phenomenon that students and lecturers get tired from watching oneself on a live video for too long, did not take place in Second Life. Even though the students watched their own avatar the whole time, but they seemed to enjoy this. Of course, students who just started as newbies had a lot to learn about how to navigate the avatar that could again increase the stress factor. But this was a temporary thing. Another big advantage. Oh, let's look at the slides here. Yeah. Here we see the virtual classroom on EduNation Island, thanks to Heike, Phil, Pierre, Gwen, Guazi, <laughs> to enabling us using for such a long time now the classroom on EduNation Island. Um, so we really enjoyed this. It's very important to have this home base for my students. Um, yeah. Another big advantage of virtual environment seems to be the sense of presence that you have and that you can feel whilst being together in one place with one person or in a classroom. In video conferencing, people miss uh, this experience of meeting at a specific place such as a university with a seminar room setting where students sit together around a table. I tried many times to offer virtual classes outside of the virtual classroom, for example at the beach or in the forest in Second Life. It always ended up in chaos, I tell you, because students were moving around um, constantly to watch what was there and the concentration was very low. The Virtual classroom was, in my experience, a great meeting place for lecturers and presentations. But, of course, I offered also ethnographic research training in virtual worlds, and this took place in the field as field work out of the classroom. I will see here our classical winter happening, so we do this every year in, in before Christmas time, we meet for ice skating, and this is um, Russell and Heike are always setting up this um, wonderful ice skating area. So this is already since 14 years now, every year we are doing <laughs> this, and it's great to have some spice wine and go with ice skates with the students. Um, the ethnographic research training um, we are offering in virtual worlds it's, um, is interview training in virtual environments, participant observation. Uh, students learn joining groups and establishing groups for their own research. They learn to set up interviews, send this to the groups. They are practicing filming and photography in virtual environments, so-called machinimas which we always publish also on our um, yearly Machinima screening events in Berlin, in real life, actual life, <laughs> if possible again, for, for sure soon. So then we always have a fireplace. We screen all of the Machinima. We come together once a year. Um, the rebuilding and staging of cultural heritage and virtual world is another very important aspect of um, research training. And, um, of course, setting up virtual conferences, exhibitions, and film screens, screenings in world. Um, it's something we trained.
Yeah, here we see a um, little overview of the teaching um, research in virtual environments for digital anthropology at last. So there's, of course, the re research about digital cultures. Um, then there's the theory and history of digital culture. We have the popular digital culture, like life simulation, ego shooter and adventure games. We have, um, of course, the serious games social online networks, religious communities, digital diaspora studies, digital art, political VR activism. Um, another important um, section is the digital storytelling, the 3D modeling of cultural assets and heritage, as we can find it a lot also here in the virtual world of Second Life. And um, digitalization at large, of course, the active involvement of the researcher um, in a local community. Um, furthermore, the whole research about user and future needs, um, the e-governance, security and surveillance sector is also very important for digital anthropology. I published um, two books together with students, and I'm also the editor of the Journal of Visual and Media Anthropology, where we publish um, Machinimas, um, small film projects um, produced in world, in Second Life, but also in other virtual worlds, and um, papers about digital anthropology and virtual worlds research. So you can have a look at this Journal of Visual and Media Anthropology. Um, and maybe you can also check out these two books. One, my first book on virtual environments and cultures is only about Second Life. It, it's a combination of many great um, research projects in Second Life um, from colleagues and students. It's already from 2013, but you can still um, find so many things who, who are classic in this. And there's the book uh, Digital Environments, who also covers a bit virtual worlds, but um, goes also beyond this and, and talking about 360 degree videos, immersive storytelling and so on. What will be the next big step in VR and AR technology? According to Mark Zuckerberg, it will be the teleportation that reach the sense of presence that you feel being together in one place with another person. He predicts um, that AR will be taking off when your friend can teleport to your couch and HMDs are smaller smart glasses um, that you can turn to sunglasses whenever you want, whenever the sun is shining. Virtual words and AR glasses will allow us to be able to work remotely and to travel without increasing our carbon footprint because this is what we need to stop climate change. Teleporting with my actual presence to a meeting or in the classroom or to sit next to my best friend on the couch whilst being with my actual body at another location seems to be the next big thing Facebook and others are planning at the moment. I think we can and we should be a bit alarmed that the very rest of our privacy, our own couch, is now also under surveillance by Facebook and Amazon. And in my opinion and with my experience, students and lecturers do not typically all of the time want to meet with the real presence. And I also do not want to invite all of my students onto my couch, honestly to say. This can be for some situation useful, for example, getting to know each other for the first time. But I think for regular meetings um, between avatars um, in virtual worlds, the virtual worlds offer such great possibilities to meet and also the avatars. I am personally more waiting for the mobile Second Life app um, with the opportunity to narrow down the world for my university and maybe um, some surrounding places 
but to access this via the smartphone would be so amazing and also the students are waiting for it and as we know they are working on it very hard we will see what the next years will bring one thing that made the few into the history of we are clear is the following it will be for sure not boring with virtual reality and also not with augmented reality and i think we need people not only with knowledge but also with a lot of fantasy and courage to face the future of education in virtual worlds thank you very much for your attention i'm happy to answer now your questions Thank you so much, Dr. Fleming. That was so interesting. And as we all know, virtual environments and virtual reality are great for learning. So much better than Zoom. We have time for a couple of questions, and we're ready to take them. I see a lot of comments here. Here's one from Gentle Heron. Wow, what a great summary of the long history of humans projecting out of their experienced reality. Very true, very true. I think the slides will be available, are they? Oh, sorry, I, the last well, slide is missing. Be available, <laughs> certainly. Um, if you have them on SlideShare, we can share that for you. Thanks for the nice, lovely comments here in the chat. I'm reading them. I'm happy about it. I put, um, yeah, I tried really to go deep back into history that 14,000 years ago. Um, actually, my research started in um, Indonesia and as an environmental anthropologist working on natural disasters. And I came later on to, to study virtual worlds and digital anthropology. And this comes together now with this climate change impacts and uh, also the pandemic. Um, I feel how these two research um, fields are now so close to each other. And um, I feel it totally made sense that I, I combined these two um, areas of my interest. But sometimes you need years to understand it. <laughs> Yes, there was a question on YouTube from Karen West, who's one of our presenters later, and she asks, how do we address faculty competency? How do we give them the courage? Good question. How do we give the, the other faculty members the courage to also um, teach in virtual worlds? Is the question? Yes. yes. Yeah. Mm. That's a really good question, yeah, because um, it's not always easy. I mean, sometimes I invite colleagues and I show them the word and either they like it or they don't like it. It's it's dif difficult to convince someone who hates it from the beginning. <laughs> um, I think at the moment is a good time with the pandemic. Um, everyone is searching for new ways of teaching online and therefore it's maybe easier to convince the faculty um, also to to establish a, a, a virtual classroom in Second Life or in another VR world like OpenSim. So we, I started with um, going on my own, finding a plot. I met Heike Gwen Guazi here and she immediately told me how what I can do and then I rented from her the plot and then I told this to my faculty, hey, I need the money for this plot. 
Um, later on, we, we rebuilt the whole um, university. Now with my new university, we rebuilt the HMKW. Um, the whole, we have a um, dependency now in OpenSim and this looks amazing. So Heike did such a great job rebuilding this. And with this um, model, I convinced the chancellor of the university. I showed them this to him and Heike also helped a little bit. and. Um, it's fantastic to have. Then he was also convinced and he was like, I want to enter this. Uh, oh, wow, my university and you open them. That's fantastic. And he immediately created an own avatar. He never, ever entered um, uh, a ritual word before, but then he even used this for the for the yearly meeting on our uh, Christmas meeting to make a demonstration on what can go on in ritual world. So this was was a big success for us also to convince the chancellor of the university. Um, but in my old university, it was not ever always easy. So I know what you were talking about. <laughs> yes, indeed. And we have we, uh, a lot of comments in the chat about from people saying, you know, you need to have that administrative support and technical support. Certainly, I understand that very, very well. Uh, too. So I think you have a lot of support here in the audience. People get it. Um, there's a question from Day Miami, and he asks, "Have you seen the VR client for Sign World? They seem to have the best functionality uh, for VR in a virtual." I'm not so familiar with, honestly, to say. Um... A science space, no. What? what yes, science what? space. Sorry. Ah. Um. Yes, but I, what? As far as I know, they are not so successful anymore. Is this true? I don't know. Heike told me about it, but I'm not so familiar with, honestly, to say. But hmm. this is a good um, hint. Thank you very much. So we will have to check this yep. out again. They always has good. Good advice. And we have one final question from Jules Doghouse. And Jules asks, are some people less inclined to engage in VR? Um, so how do we decide whether a subject is good for VR education? Um, depends, of course, on the discipline yeah, you are teaching. And this is maybe the question also yeah, for for ethnographic methods, it's, it's quite interesting that because students can roam around, they can conduct interviews and so on. So maybe not for all of the science, this is a um, useful environment to teach. But I think what setting up exhibitions with uh, research results, for example, is very simple. Yeah, This uh, is very important for all of the disciplines. Um, yes. I don't know if I got, the, I, this is the answer to the question, or maybe you can reformulate it. Um, I, I think, I think you answered it. It does depend very much on, um, on the topic and the students and the faculty and yeah, there. Jules says, thank you. You've given him some, some food for thought. Well, everyone, let's give uh, Dr. Fleming a really big hand. We're all off to visit our environments and check out the next two sessions. What an applause. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's fantastic. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Lorraine, and thanks to Hike and all of the others. So it's such a professional organization of this conference. I really enjoyed it. And thank you so much for having me. We've really enjoyed having you as well. <laughs> See you around the conference, folks. <laughs> <laughs>